We're going to hear from Fiza Vasudeva and Nick Bakto, Fiza Vasudeva and Nicholas Bakto, uh, on the topic of their paper is the trans gaming experience, mimetic approaches to gender and identity in video games. And the floor is yours, guys. The room is yours. The, the space is yours. Uh, let me. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. We were hoping to be in Vietnam for this, but uh, I guess we'll have to make do with this. And uh, thank you, John, and the entire team like for organizing this. I know what, what a hassle can the entire thing be. Uh, so uh, my name is Fiza, uh, I'm Fiza Vasudeva, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at NYCU Taiwan. And uh, Nick Valgo is my co-author. He's a PhD and also a game developer. Uh, so he's uh, he's developed several games himself. Uh, so his work lies at the nexus of uh, academia and uh, the industry. So our, our research is tied up with game studies, a field that we feel receives a comparatively less uh, less attention in academic domains, especially when you compare it to other forms of popular uh, media and popular culture. Uh, in this research, we theorize that video games basically stand at the uh, nexus of uh, existing film and internet theory with a uh, modern update. They provide a mimetic virtual space where it is possible not only to experience as a gazing subject, but also to uh, participate in becoming the protagonist. So through uh, exploration of effective uh, mimetic approaches, we want to highlight how uh, players can participate uh, in the trans experience and understand things like uh, gender dysphoria. So just a brief note on the methodology. Uh, for, we, uh, for, for this research, we, uh, the research was more qualitative. We played several of the games and we examined the games uh, uh, which were not uh, uh, character creative games. Uh, but where uh, which are like where you can customize your avatar and choose your pronouns rather our focus was on intentional inclusions of uh, inclusion of the trans uh, experience and transgender representation either in the character or or, uh, or by the creator or, or which use trans code as a metaphor for uh, transition transformation and means of representation so uh, just to talk about our transgender identity a bit, uh, so transness, transgender uh, is often viewed as a negative identity, uh, not a man or not a woman, or they are made to conform uh, with the ideas of uh, heterosexual or homosexual systems in theoretical uh, discourses. So here we have taken a capacious, a wide definition by uh, Susan Stryker, who uh, views transgender as a movement across a socially imposed boundary away from um, a chosen an unchosen starting place rather than any particular destination or mode of transition. So uh, basically, this definition has a focus on self-identification, which allows us to see the malleability of the transgender and transness, uh, a concept which basically includes a, a lot of uh, gender variant practices and embodiments and identities which challenge the uh, assumed stability or the na and the naturalness of the ideas of bi uh, biological sex or uh, sexuality, gender, etc. So moving on, uh, because we are looking at transgender uh, uh, representation to an extent as well, so we find that it's been comparatively lacking uh, in tradition, traditional media itself. And we can see a similar trend um, in video games. So if you see the uh, the diagram on the right, the yellow one would represent uh, like the trans uh, characters or trans representation. And it's comparatively low, even when you see it like in comparison to other LGBTQ uh, 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 things, okay. So, the representational uh, matrix of uh, trans related concepts uh, uh, is done, uh, it's shown on the uh, left side or uh, uh, in the left graph. So the most common, uh, some of some of some of the uh, representational uh, metrics has been done in the framework of uh, dysphoria or trapped in the wrong body. So basically you are, uh, you're stuck in a wrong body and then you cannot associate it with it. Uh, then there is of a physical transition or, or mental illness where trans people are uh, shown as mentally ill, they're shown as killers, they're shown as violent, uh, or there's a trans shock and trans reveal, like uh, just to like uh, get the consumers or like the shock value. 
uh, and the, however, the highest uh, representation is in the form of ambiguity. And this can be uh, because of a number of reasons, uh, maybe industry, uh, uh, like commercial success, uh, ambiguity uh, leaves uh, higher chances of people playing or, and like, or, or basically it's like a, maybe a safeguard against case, uh, cancel culture today. So uh, the, uh, what, what these uh, representational metrics do, they basically uh, reinforce, uh, they, 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 uh, they, have a, they carry a risk of reinforcing trans normativity, which is uh, problematic. Okay. So as I've mentioned through our research that we've tried to explore transness in video games through an intersection of uh, existing film and internet theory, uh, within uh, internet sphere, uh, sphere uh, Sherry Turkle's work uh, comes to my uh, mind like when we were researching. So she has shown that cyberspace challenges the conventional and traditional ex uh, accepted norms of identity while allowing the possibility of discovery of uh, multiple se uh, self. She also suggested that our online personas can help uh, expand our range into the real world. And research itself has highlighted that it's easier to explore our gender identities online rather than offline. So, um, and this exploration is possible uh, through or in video games uh, uh, because they can create systems of representation and processing subjectivities. Uh, mimetic exploration, uh, which, uh, base, which is associated with a maximum of information and a minimal of minimal presence of the one who informs, can be particularly helpful. Games can provide us with a mimetic space uh, where the players often have to physically act out narratives by pressing buttons and making choices to play video games. So they become a way of embodying a subjectivity of the players, uh, allowing them to conceive and experiment with their uh, ideas of uh, gender, the identity, uh, while uh, allowing identification with the subject of the game. Uh, <clears throat> So Laura Mulvey, uh, a very famous scholar, uh, she talks about identification with the hero or subject of a piece of media, especially when female audience members are still uh, are adept at taking the role of masculine hero, uh, even if the clothes of this transvertism uh, ride uh, uncomfortably uh, at length. And while Mulvey's work uh, looked, uh, uh, looked at gender through a binary lens, it did highlight the relational characters of gender identities, the role played by active uh, and passive dialect, dialectic and the realization through the visual forms. Uh, so now we'll just uh, get right into the, the video games and see how they have portrayed trans characters and Nick will take over from here. Okay. <clears throat> Apologize. Apologies to Laura Mulvey. I think you misspelled her name there. Yeah. Um, so if we look at video games, uh, the history of video games, if you do any sort of research, you quickly find that a lot of people list this character Birdo as the first quote unquote trans video game character. Uh, because in the uh, manual for Super Mario 2 on the left here, you can see it says Birdo, he thinks he is a girl and he spits eggs from his mouth. He'd rather be called Birdetta. So uh, clearly a problematic view of the first trans character and uh, Nintendo is aware of this, um, this, the changing society around, around transness. Because on the right here, we've included a screenshot from a um, Super Smash Brothers, a later game. And it says Birdo is a pink cre creature of indeterminate gender this time, instead of he. Uh, that some say would rather be called Birdetta. A big ribbon on his head is his most distinguishing creature. So there's an update to that, but still, um, we found that mainstream games uh, represented in the beginning represent transness in a problematic way. So then we come to uh, the first game that we studied, which is Tell Me Why. And it was publicized as something along the lines of the first major game with a trans main character. And why all the uh, qualifiers uh, is because uh, they were aware of, of Birdo that I, I just spoke about. And so they're trying to uh, show, to indicate to, to press basically and to the market that, uh, okay, now we're going to, to represent a trans character in a healthy way. And so it's, a, it's a clearly a mainstream target audience, but that means avoiding risky techniques that we found in, in the other 
in independently developed games that we've examined. So as a result, uh, the storytelling kind of takes on the form of, <laughs> sorry, I can't read our slide, of observing Tyler, the, main, the trans characters uh, from the outside and through dialogue choices that are probably more diegetic than mimetic. So it, it serves as a contrast for the other games. So here's, here's the disclaimer from Tommy White. It says, Tell me why it was developed with guidance from cultural, mental health, and transgender advocates. The game portrays intense situations related to family violence and emotional trauma. To learn more about these issues and to find resources, please visit our website. So uh, this is a careful disclaimer. There's nothing negative about the disclaimer, of course, but it it indicates that this is a, for sure, a product meant to um, latch onto the trend of you know, progressive politics, and what happens. <laughs> and the result is uh, that the storytelling becomes more diegetic. So here's an example of diegetic storytelling in Tell Me Why. So you have uh, their childhood acquaintance, Sam, saying that he's never seen a woman that looks so much like a man. And your gameplay choices here are to respond, I am a man or I'm just me. And while these choices are slightly different in the dialogue that will happen, it makes you sort of an observer, um, an outside observer of an object rather than a participator in the subjectivity, I think. So here's the first example of an independent game that we looked at that uh, approached transness through a more mimetic approach. Uh, it's called Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor. And it takes a mimetic approach by the metaphor of gender as commodified necessity. So, um, you're a janitor on an alien spaceport, and the way you make money is by incinerating trash that you find on the floor. And that allows you to barely afford food, while at the same time uh, purchasing gender from vending machines. You can only change your gender by uh, buying it from gender machines. And the genders that you purchase come in descriptive subject subjective feelings, like they're called things like cuddle sluts, Crystal, Susan Sarandon, not male and female. There are many genders. And what happens if you if you don't buy gender and, and refresh it is that the game slowly becomes unplayable. So the metaphor of dysphoria is actually felt by the player because the text becomes unreadable, you get warnings that you feel awful, the graphics become grainy, the gameplay actually becomes unpleasant. And when you refresh your gender, you always feel amazing. So the, the metaphor is pretty clear there. So here's, I've shown a picture of gender as commodified necessity in, in Diaries of Space Support Janitor. Here it says, you need to gender shift, look for a gender kiosk. So here is the gender kiosk. Uh, it says gender in huge letters there. And once you um, refresh your gender, it says your gender is now cuddle slut. You feel amazing. Okay, next game we looked at was Lady Killer in a Bind, which uh, takes a different approach. And all of these games, they, we found that there's an infinite amount of possibilities for, for doing a, a mimetic approach in gameplay, which is the wonderful thing about this medium. So in this one, the player takes on the first person role of a woman impersonating her brother to infiltrate his social circle. And in so doing, your choices actually lead to dates with a variety of characters and sometimes sex scenes. So playing the game then becomes playing out fantasies, both gender fantasies and sexuality fantasies, and also just sex fantasies. Um, and here's, here's an example. So the main character in the front here, she's dressed like a man, but she's wearing a choker put on her by this other character. And a choker is a, a trans-coded article of clothing. A, a lot of trans people, trans, trans feminine people will wear a choker to cover up their neck. And so this character is saying to you, what do you think? It really suits you a lot more than the menswear, don't you think? And this is a character that you can spend the night with anytime you want, but she, it's a, there's a trade-off in that she wants you to be submissive in exchange. 
So you can answer here sincerely, you can say, what does this mean? Or you can answer in a submissive way and say, yes. And so here you, you have a, a wide variety of options as a player, a female player, a male player, or any range of sexualities and genders in between that you identify with, there's some sort of uh, crossing those boundaries and, and playing around with fantasies that goes on in this game. The next game we looked at was Celeste, uh, which is a mountain climber's difficult journey up a mountain. And it becomes a metaphor for the challenges of facing her own identity and depression. So uh, once this game was released, players suspected that the coding was uh, signaling a trans character. And the developers confirmed that indeed the main character is trans. And the biggest example of this trans coding is that at one point, the protagonist uh, faces her alter ego in a mirror realm. And mirrors, uh, they, they present you your physical form to yourself. So in, it's another trans coding of mirrors confronting yourself in the mirror. Her alter ego forces her to face her depression. And the game is extremely difficult, uh, which takes on the metaphor of dysphoria through gameplay. So. Uh, yeah, also during, during the mirror level, the, the trans musical composer of the game wrote a track about, and uh, there's lyrics in there about her experience you know, being trans and with dysphoria, but it's played in reverse again with the mirror theme. So here's the struggle with identity and transformation in Celeste. Here, her mirror personality is saying, don't like what you see. So again, a pretty obvious metaphor there. Then the finally, uh, final uh, game we looked at was actually called Dysphoria. And this is perhaps, uh, in our opinion, the purest example we found of transness gamified. Because uh, although the mini games are very abstract at times, uh, they're designed to let you actually experience each chapter of transition. And the difficulty of the game, where games usually start, start out easy and become more difficult, this, this game becomes, starts out more difficult and becomes more easy as you transition. So in this game, the daily challenges of dysphoria and transitioning are expressed in the challenges of met metaphorical mini games. So things like shaving or being called sir as you walk down the street become difficult obstacles in, in miniature segments that compose your daily life. And it's a very uh, personal game because um, Anne Anthropy, the creator, did all of the artwork, all of the coding, and she even voiced the sound effects with her own voice. So you really feel, you feel the experience. So here are some examples from Dysphoria. The first mini game, you walk from the left side of the screen to your house while everyone calls you sir along the way. It's more of an annoyance than a challenge. Sorry. Okay, just, uh, this is the last slide almost. Uh, and then the next one is uh, the doctor's telling you uh, you can't you prescribe estrogen until you get your blood pressure down. You're catching the pills in your mouth. And then the third one is a, a more obvious metaphor of breaking boundaries. Okay. I, uh, because we don't have time, so I will be uh, very quick. Um, so video games uh, do have a gendered located subjectivity um, and a player's subjectivity can intermingle and collide within the video game's uh, representational structure uh, as the player takes meaningful uh, action within the game system. So uh, within this uh, approach, uh, mimetic learning, mimetic experience can really help uh, because it may uh, fill or enrich their embodiment of gender identity with their own gender identification. Uh, finding important uh, transgender identity, or uh, it, they may learn to take critical gaze that they carry throughout the play. So the possibilities are endless, and uh, this is what we've tried to explore in the in this ongoing project. Thank you. Okay. All right, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Visa and Nick. Um, we we have a couple of questions already, but we're going to save them because we'll go straight into Ratan uh, next. If you would, Ratan. Uh, yeah, he'll present his paper, take off your mic, yes. Uh, now, Ratan is, um, I'm not going to do big introductions, but he's, he's Ratan Kumar Roy, uh, and he's speaking on Anthropology of Media, an Invitation for Disciplinary Boundary Crossing 
in South Asia. And uh, the room for, for the next 20 minutes is, is yours, Ratan. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't join earlier. And there are some interruptions happening. But yeah. So uh, I think uh, PPTs have been visible. And if so, um, so as you have uh, given a uh, little bit, like you have already spilled out the title. So this paper is basically uh, my uh, constant engagement to understand the disciplinary issues and the challenges in contemporary South Asia. And when I talk about South Asia, certainly South Asia, not only as a geographical region, but also to look at uh, the country specific cases and, and, and the academic uh, practices in, in but, uh, in countries, particularly uh, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, uh, Maldives, we don't have much higher educational institutes, but then uh, there are scholars who are trying to work uh, abroad and, and they are trying to understand uh, the contemporary issues relating to cultural studies, media studies, or maybe sociology and social anthropology. Even uh, in South Asian University, where I have graduated from, uh, we have tried engaging with the disciplinary challenges in, in South Asia to engage with sociology or social anthropology and media uh, studies. So here, when we are talking about media anthropology, which is quite popular as a sub-discipline uh, in larger social sciences, uh, when it comes and we try to uh, draw uh, from media anthropology and lots of scholars maybe these days are working in this line. What I have uh, tried to engage that what if we try to engage with uh, the research approach or the relevance of anthropology of media in, in contemporary South Asia and, and what are the challenges, what are the possibilities of uh, research and innovation as we are uh, Okay. So, uh, and then uh, to see that how one can accommodate and strengthen the anthropology of media which can open a new terrain in the research and innovation both for the disciplines of sociology or social anthropology you say or maybe media and communication studies. Now here I must uh, give a footnote because when we say sociology and social anthropology uh, like as this part of the world in South Asia like you know uh, what is being called sociology in some departments are naming them sociology some departments are naming them anthropology but that is also socio-cultural anthropology or social cultural anthropology something like that for example in Bangladesh what is called anthropology department in India you will see they are being called themselves sociologists so these kind of things are there now uh, uh, if we if we if we try to see that this what I am trying to understand it within the larger uh, 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 larger perspective of cross-disciplinary uh, research or maybe interdisciplinary research, which has also its own uh, uh, pitfalls because uh, cross-disciplinary research and collaboration. If you if you want to trace uh, in 19th century, 20th century, there has been uh, in US particularly uh, there has there has been a, an initiative uh, uh, to 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 uh, you know bring the disciplinary uh, uh, interventions together but when we talk in south asia we see that we have been following the reference model from the west and even uh, the 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 uh, uh, you know kind of renowned sociologists or anthropologists have spoken about it when they try to develop the sociology of india or indian sociology or if there is at all a south asian sociology or south asian anthropology then they were uh, trying to uh, see the uh, problem of uh, reference model firstly, which they are basically a borrowed anthropology or borrowed sociology from the West. Uh, and then the major problem which uh, has happened to interdisciplinary research in South Asia is that there is a severe, uh, you know, kind of, I would say, anxiety or skepticism and which are coming from these uh, three points of uh, three points which I have pointed out here. One is the absence of wider consensus at the epistemic level, then the failure of effective collaboration on the conceptual and empirical grounds uh, between the disciplines and the lack of substantial theoretical and methodological grounds for the interdisciplinary uh, research and, uh, and, and, the, and the, you know, kind of framework. So, uh, here what is happening that uh, this 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 background is actually not uh, allowing the uh, traditional disciplines to uh, 
to to maybe cross the boundaries so whenever we we try to talk about interdisciplinary research in south asia for for a greater possibility for innovation innovative research and collaboration every time we have found a rigidity coming from all the mainstream disciplines that you know my discipline is superior than your and 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 even in practical realm we have uh, like in my uh, in to, to even do this paper when i was talking to the scholars from columbia university or dhaka university or universities in uh, delhi or in other places in india they are saying that you know like it's very difficult to even uh, department to department collaboration or discussion or even the graduate students always uh, gain this sense that you know my department or my subject is superior than yours so that uh, that kind of uh, understanding even in the graduate level is actually not allowing the researchers when they are going into a uh, uh, proper research stage in their in, in their life partic particularly doing their phd's or or post doctoral researches so uh, there i am coming with this point of the possibility of anthropology of media and where i am trying to talk about social anthropology in one hand and media and communication research in one hand now certainly uh, uh, social anthropology as a discipline uh, it is a traditional discipline in the context of south asia uh, they don't consider themselves interdisciplinary while media and communication studies uh, they are coming under the larger stream of interdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary research so uh, when they are talking about interdisciplinary or interdisciplinary research media and communication studies the problem here what happens uh, though they are largely in uh, doing social scientific research but uh, the the growth of media uh, platforms particularly or media industry in south asia that has resulted the the disciplines like media and communication studies actually falling into that trap of you know kind of filling the gap of the industry providing the manpower to the industry or maybe more like tilting more towards the social scientific research they were uh, tilting more towards the market research or very uh, traditional media and communication research or marketing research and then we can see the 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 uh, subjects or disciplines coming like journalism and new media studies or maybe you know cultural studies not with that critical venture but uh, more of a uh, uh, kind of you know uh, responding to the need of the uh, market uh, or maybe media industry and here sociology and the distance uh, with the sociology and anthropology is becoming uh, uh, much more uh, which we we thought we can actually kind of you know minimize uh, because lots of so sociologists in in south asia have also tried uh, engaging with the media research and communication research but then the question they had to face is what is sociological in it or what is anthropological in it so in this way actually the possible scope for intervention and innovation uh, uh, and how one can actually see a possible uh, meeting ground or possible knowledge sharing and exchange between the media scholars if i if i may say if there is somebody because lots of people would call they are media scholars and they would say that okay so they are they are borrowing from sociology social anthropology sometime but they also try to see that you know no media studies has its own uh, take on 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 theoretical and methodological ground and when you are engaging with those research you see that there are severe issues with the methodological orientation particularly uh, what are the epistemic uh, viewpoints they are borrowing from and and then you see that those re those researches are not able to move beyond the uh, 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 you know impact study or uh, effect studies or even if you, if you if you want to look at very much of audience studies in media uh, particularly you would see that those audience studies are not able to uh, 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 move beyond the marketing research or the impact studies as i have said so uh, now uh, there in in this in this week actually my 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 uh, uh, take is maybe uh, uh, we have a tendency here to borrow another sub disciplines of media study uh, media anthropology which is popular uh, in the west and lots of scholars today are calling me i am a media anthropologist so uh, why i am saying this because now and then whenever somebody is trying to bring some innovation and uh, in, in the name of interdisciplinary research they are much more interested of opening a new discipline or a new sub sub disciplinary platform 
with certain uh, you know administrative uh, administrative autonomy uh, and there actually again the problem uh, uh, is becoming crucial for us and the challenge because uh, you are again creating certain level of superiority that you know this sub discipline is uh, superior and better uh, because we have brought some sort of uh, uh, you know interactive understanding but in the name of interactive understanding what is happening that neither they are uh, trying to fall back to the sociology or social anthropology and nor in the communication studies uh, so uh, even uh, this problem uh, sometime back we were talking with the media and communication studies scholar that there you you the media and communication studies in india and elsewhere have been uh, falling under not mainstream arts and social science and humanities but falling under the interdisciplinary stream but when we are talking about interdisciplinary stream uh, this ideally should uh, actually uh, look at the communication studies more which maybe Chris and other people are saying that you know communication studies should uh, look at much more social significance of the uh, of the of the of the technology uh, and maybe uh, look at the cultural worldview but here the communication studies is becoming more of uh, the communication platforms or the media platforms oriented so it is much more a platform oriented studies than the social oriented studies or cultural oriented studies and there i think the communication and media are uh, again uh, moving away from the sociological theories and practices as well as social anthropological uh, methods or maybe there, there is hard, there hardly you will find the ethnographic approach within the media and communication studies. So uh, when that is the problem, we, why we are talking about this, why we are talking about, why we, why we, we even need uh, as media anthropology or communication anthropology or anthropology of media and communication. The need has been actually uh, much more uh, felt in the contemporary time because young scholars have been trying to uh, engage with the uh, you know cultural forms with this changing media terrain either you call about video games sometime back we have seen this uh, presentation or maybe the digital media practices even lots of scholars are trying to understand the media and communication development in contemporary south asia from a socio-historical background and that is i think uh, creating uh, 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 more uh, creating a, a positive atmosphere for the for the larger uh, social science academic in South Asia that we need to maybe uh, bring the scholars together and see what kind of potential this kind of boundary crossing can provide us. So from there, I am uh, I am trying to uh, uh, you know, kind of you know invite a call for anthropology of media and what can be the possible uh, uh, possible uh, kind of you know uh, intervention as as I am trying to say and what kind of innovation it can bring. So uh, precisely, I have tried to point out four. Uh, uh, kind of objectives I will quickly move in as you can see that you know uh, so for the innovation in social sciences I think this is the high time to encourage the disciplinary boundary crossing I will finish in uh, three minutes uh, uh, that could enable the researchers producing socio-culturally meaningful research on media and communication uh, research and in order to promote such kind of anthropology of media as an emerging research stream uh, the, the set of agendas, I, I would just read out this, situating media in everyday social actions that would enable one to understand the mediated social relations, then outlining the social historical context of media forms and platforms, which otherwise may be uh, getting into a much more uh, marketing research and one has to maybe think, uh, rethink about it and one can see the information and communication processes and practices. Uh, rather than uh, what are the call for the industry and then critically examine the interface between media, culture and communication with the purview of local and global, colonial and post-colonial, traditional and modern, national and transnational, public and private, state and market inter -alia. This part is very uh, important because then only you can contextualize the South Asian nation states, its disciplinary development with the colonial and post-colonial realities. And finally, to encourage cross-border communication research and comparative media and cultural studies in South Asia. So to uh, end, I would say that there is also a risk factor uh, added into this because we, as I have said, there is a tendency of opening a new department. So this also comes with a risk of uh, you know, provoking to a new sub-disciplinary jurisdiction. 
I think one should think beyond that kind of jurisdiction and maybe, uh, you know, the scholars should come together and try to, uh, you know, recognize media anthropology as a subdiscipline, but it would be productive uh, to think of the idea of an anthropology of media and communication as a broader research stream rather than a discipline or subdiscipline to encourage innovative knowledge practice. I would end here maybe and we can engage in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Ratan, fantastic. Um, we've got a number of questions that have come up for Fiza and um, Nick. Uh, and maybe while we're going through them, some will come up for Ratan. I've certainly got some for you, Ratan. Um, but actually, maybe we'll start with my one because my one's for both of you. Right, so I'm thinking, I want, well, I wish Sarab was here as well because talking about disciplinarity, but I want Ratan to fit what Fiza and Nick have done into the disciplinary. What, what kind of anthropology was that? Um, uh, what kind of field work is it that you do online? Because isn't it really interesting that ethnograph ethnography is not really the same online and in games and so on? And you know, what's really distinctive about the whole online world and game world is, you know, what people still sometimes seem to be amazed at, the online world is not real, exactly the same as real life. Your identity is not mirrored completely, right? It's, it's as if it's a, you know, and you, you can't expect the um, presentation of self in a completely representational, presentational world where performance and presentation of self is everything to marrow, match what happens in the so-called real. But that's really a critique of ethnography because isn't the so-called real all about the self-presentation and mirroring and, and faking of selves and identities, right? Do you see how that's a question for both of you in a way? How, how can you do any kind of old style anthropology in this new world of uh, mirrors and representations and so? And surely doesn't that mean, well, so how could you ever have done old anthropology? Because it was always like that. People were always presenting themselves, right? If that sounds like a question, maybe it's not. <laughs> So first of all, Ratan, where, 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 where did, can I get the uh, yeah, conversation I think, to be? I, I think I think I get what, you, what the point you are trying to raise more than a question. Maybe it, it is a very interesting pointer for for uh, getting into a discussion because when uh, I think it's uh, the the presentation I was partly uh, listening from his uh, 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 yeah both of you. So uh, what happened? Yeah, what happened is that you know when we do this kind of techno. Uh, logical studies. Uh, the problem is uh, for me coming more into the methodology part and as, as you rightly pointed out that doing ethnography online or these days people are calling about ethnography. But why to talk only about the old school anthropological research where the field work has to happen in a very participant observation oriented uh, studies. Like the people who are doing very, very mainstream media studies, they can also conduct long term, uh, maybe, you know, observation to a, part, to, to a particular practices, maybe online, or maybe the, look at the comments which are happening, maybe in a YouTube, just giving some examples, maybe just to, to, to uh, uh, kind of, you know, rethink about the uh, uh, practices, which may be uh, uh, very traditional anthropologists would, would always question that, okay, what kind of anthropology is this? Because this is the question every researcher would uh, hear from the board that what is anthropological in it. Now, for me, if it has certain understanding of culture and meaning making, if it is not only technological but technosocial, if it is psychosocial, so all these elements are, I think, there in, in, in this kind of studies which we are doing, either it is on video game or if it is about, a, you know, we are, we are watching a squid game and the hype of a squid game these days, why, what kind of generation, why we are talking about it, why we are engaging with a particular, uh, you know, series which are becoming, by, uh, which are, which are becoming popular. So uh, I think the meaning making, the social relevance, the cultural orientation aspects, would make it anthropological, whatever media and mediated practices we are looking at. That would be my, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, engagement here. 
Uh, yeah, I would just like to add that, you know, I, I, I come from internet studies and what the biggest thing about it that I, I would say, this is the most important thing I would say is that the, the media, the media has to be part of it. Um, because, uh, yeah, one thing that a lot of, especially Western internet studies does is it says, oh, you can be anyone you want online. That's actually not true. A white man can be anyone they want online because white men created the internet. And so they're adept at using that technology and they can disappear and become wh whoever they want on the internet. A lot of other people have to carry their bodies online or into technology. So for example, uh, a woman in India's relationship with technology up until recently may have been just a person in a call center in, uh, uh, answering calls from Americans. Um, so, but now, uh, you know, the di digital divide I think is closing more and more. So yeah, I just want to uh, kind of clarify about the, uh, the video games thing. It, it's not, an, there, there are problems uh, with, with the media. But uh, we just wanted to highlight the p potential there for identity and exploring identity. So, okay, great. Let me let me uh, go to some of the questions I've been asked to read out, so we get them done too, because uh, some of them are really good. Uh, one from uh, Nia, who's a, a comrade here on staff in our faculty. Uh, his, he asks, um, who usually to to Visa and Nick. Who usually participates in these types of games? Can you give their demographic characteristics, e.g., gender, age, race, occupation? Thank you. Uh, I'll put also another one while we're doing this, so we take a few, because this one's not really a question. It's from Roshni Sen. Uh, she says, No question now, but just congratulations to Fiza. Great paper, very fresh approach, and she takes her leaves, says, All the best. Um, Daniel Hellman says, wonderful talk. Can you say more about the scope of your games search? Game search, not games research. That's, I don't know, if there's some significance in that. Are there other places where there may be games, perhaps not in English, that weren't included? What about games from East Asia? Also, how is the business potential of these games? Okay, um, then. Yeah, well, let's take those two first. Okay, well, we, um, we kind of, our methodology is more uh, qualitative than quantitative. So we don't know much about the demographics, but I can tell you uh, a lot of these games are popular in the trans community and aren't seen outside of the trans community. Except for like Celeste's uh, is a very popular breakout kit. Um, but yeah, the, to tie in with the second question there, the scope, um, there are thousands and thousands of games made and released commercially on major platforms every year. So it'd be impossible to even touch a fraction of them. So our, our search started with um, looking at those statistics of how many, uh, how many games represent transness, looking kind of at what, what they listed as examples but also I asked colleagues in the game, game developer community for suggestions on good trans games to play. And then of course, there's also, yeah, the, the very, the very popular examples like Celeste and then <coughs> um, like Dysphoria is kind of like a legendary game in the trans indie community. So um, yeah, this is kind of a, a frontier topic. Uh, both games, I don't think games uh, studies is taken very seriously in academics yet. And then transness is, is coming up as a topic as well. So we basically looked at the English market. Of course, there are other games we could look at, but um, there are language barriers, obviously, and there are barriers in uh, considering from our cultural perspectives, what we can say about other cultures and what statements we can make. So yeah, we, that's why we mainly looked at these examples. There's so many others we could have done. Um, yeah, that's our answer to that. Anything to add? 
<laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, one more question that's on the list for, for you, there might be more in a minute, um, is from, oh, Tran Minten, do you want to ask your question? Tran, can I get you to unmute and... Oh, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, right. So I just uh, have a, um, a two questions, a two short questions. Um, the first one is, do you think that storytelling games relating to LGBTQ, LGBT, um, LGBT community like this can cause gender confusion? And the second question is, are these games are problematic just because it is problematic in its essence without considering the, num the amount of people playing it and the effect it has on the people? Because uh, I, I think the majority of people um, might watch, watch uh, the game, watch the people playing the actual game instead of playing the thing themselves. So I don't think the effect it has is kind of um, insignificant because uh, it's mainly kind of uh, our curiosity to just watch the game instead to figure out the situation, what might happen and such. Yeah. Talking about streamers. Yeah. Uh, when I when I read your question, the first answer, like the, the first answer that came to my mind was no. Uh, but then I it, it got me thinking. Uh, in a lot of games, uh, especially AAA games, or like which are basically like uh, commercial blockbuster games or like largely popular games, uh, the representation of uh, LGBTQ characters can be very uh, one-dimensional. So they might show them, uh, as I mentioned, like transness has been showed as uh, uh, like like through the lens of ambiguity, or like they have like they're, sh they're shown as like caricatures, like made fun of. So of course these can I won't say they would particularly cause gender confusion, but they also they affect the idea of gender negatively, and so that is why what we have done and at least the games that we have picked up we have tried to show the potential the the, the other side the potential that the games can have, uh in 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 uh in allowing people to experience the subjectivity of uh, 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 uh different identities, so. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, on the streaming question, whether you play a game or watch someone play a game, it's still um, a meaning-making medium, I think. Just like watching a movie, uh, you can still find meaning in watching a film, even though you're not participating in it. And um, you can still interpolate you, and you can, you can identify with the characters. So I, I don't think there, I mean, maybe it's more potence to actually play the game yourself or not I don't know as far as gender confusion though um, I, I would change that maybe to gender questioning to something not so uh, negative and then it could be a positive experience for someone to discover the, their identity through through this medium and as far as like having a negative impact on people uh, it's kind of interesting that video games, have a, a lot of people bring this up with video games like in the u.s a lot of politicians will say oh this these school shootings are caused by video games violence is caused by video games donald trump said that right oh yeah and even back to the 90s and there's yeah, never so. been any correlation between these things so yeah that's my answer there okay so i want to kind of scale up from this question about streaming right to think about disciplines again, so to bring Ratan again, in again. But I also feel a bit guilty about this because when Trin's question is, is great, but it's, a, it's also kind of the question I want to ask myself because my kids are watching a lot of people playing games. And I don't think that anthropology as a discipline can be like a place to give you answers about how to live your life. I mean, that's, it's not just that. Right? But a kind of thing to say, how can we actually get answers or study or understand? Because I really do want to know why my kids actually enjoy watching other people play Toko Life World or something. Okay, they're five and eight. They're little, very little kids. But why? And then I think, like, when I was a kid, it would have been the height of boredom to watch someone play Monopoly or, or something like that. All right. But then I thought when I was older, yeah, I, I did watch people play chess. 
And I watched people play pinball. You'd watch, you'd stand around the pinball machine and watch somebody up, but you were waiting for it to be your turn. But here, my kids are spending hours. How do we not only study that, but what's the social explanation? What's that? Let's scale up from that to think about how does anthropology deal with these kind of problems in the family or something like that? Because that's in a way what, what Trump and all the other parental advisory lyrics people are, are saying as well. Like we need to understand media and how it's reformatting our kids' brains. Yeah, but right? I mean, the same questions come up with like when the novel came out, when TV came, it's always uh, the same cycle, right? I think uh, the, I, I also watch uh, one particular person play one game um, pretty regularly. And for me, it's no different from watching a sports game. Um, I could play the game myself, but I am not very good at it. And I'd rather watch someone that's really good at it play it. And also it's kind of, um, there's a parasocial aspect. It's kind of like discovering something together when you watch your favorite streamer, you, you have, a, perceived relationship with them or sometimes even a real relationship because you can comment and they'll read it and these things and so yeah just just discovering new stories because that, that's the thing about games even the classic example game designers go back to is, is chess uh you have these abstract pieces one's called a bishop doesn't look much like a bishop the the knight looks like a horse but th this these shapes are just enough to for your mind to create a story of what's happening and you know you could you could even imagine an entire battle if you wanted to i don't think most people do but it's still it's a new unique story every time that it happens so that's why i think it's such an attractive thing to watch video games ratan any any comment on this i mean i'm, I'm thinking Levi Strauss, structural analysis of storytelling in the mythologies of watching chess or, or taco life. Well, my kids aren't watching virtuoso players. They're watching hours and hours of the most boring things, I think. But, you know, maybe they like it. I don't, I want to understand that. But, uh, yeah, what are our, our, our resources for making sense of, of these things, right? Is it the study of myth? Rattan's disappeared, actually. Oh, came back. I don't know whether there's mileage in that, that line. Um, uh, if anyone else has any questions. So, okay. I give it a second more. Uh, well, I, I have one more question for um, um, Fiza and, and, and Nick. Is um, is this a part of a larger project? Are you doing long-term field work by playing these games, or is this operationalizing something you were doing anyway for fun? And can you talk about how that's related to the experience of making a game? Because I know Nick that you're uh, made a super successful. <laughs> Okay, not so. Uh, I don't know whether it's been successful or not, but uh, a game that is out there among the thousands. What's the experience of making as opposed to studying? Oh, oh do you want to go first? You can, you can go first. Uh, well, we're not finished with this research. Um, I, I feel uh, with the 3,000 word limit much chance to explore but yeah i feel we also need to uh develop our uh, theory background more like uh because i feel i feel there's a lot of potential here but it's so underexplored so we have to like explore it from different angles so so far we have looked at like of course really popular theorists but we uh i particularly want to uh take laura Mulvey's work work like further ahead and maybe think about like maybe transgender gays instead of just like male gaze or like queer queer gaze and how like if someone like is playing through that experience how does that affect uh, the meaning making so it, so it's definitely an ongoing project one interesting thing that Fiza uncovered during the research is a lot of game studies papers over and over they would say 
game studies hasn't had the Laura Mulvey moments. And that's really interesting. Like, why are you yeah. writing a paper then? Like, try to try to make it happen, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, I guess I'm interested in this, well, because of my work, but also I'd like to see, um, I, I don't think the idea of how games can make meaning and how they can be art has been explored very much. And so, yeah, it's it wasn't really part of something we were already doing. It's it's more like a direction we want to start going in. And yeah, about the difference between making and studying games. Well, no, I think that I think that they're the, they're the same thing because um, uh, to make games, I think you need to study games. So that's that's what started my interest in it, and. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm very, well, sales wise, sure, I've sold some games, but the sales are not as important to me as feeling like I've made something that, uh, is matters or is significant to the way I view the world and the way I feel. I don't think I've, um, reached that yet. So in trying to study like how games uh, affect people and make meaning, I'm trying to trying to find out find the ways to to make games and that are effective, basically. Um, related to what Fisa had said about theory, um, what strikes me very strongly is how it might be very useful to think of the work of Ariella Azule and what she does with photography. I don't know if you know her work, but uh, she's been done a kind of Laura Mulvey moment for photography in a way by saying it's not just about who takes the photograph, but also responsibility of everyone in the whole scene of the photograph. And that seems like a in the round way to think anthropologically, ethnographically, or, or just, just generally about uh, the process of meaning making. And it also helps us maybe get away with something that I found that I wanted to talk about from Ratan's paper, but I wanted to be a bit more general as well. How, not how we can stop, but how come so much of our discipline, sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, are moving towards something that's not much different than market research? I mean, that's, that was early on in your paper, but that seemed like, oh my God, we really need to talk about that because that's a, a huge problem. Now, um, we're encouraged to, to untheorize, to dumb down our, uh, well, I see it that way. Maybe, uh, I don't know if you, you could elaborate a little bit on that, and especially what you said about cultural studies without critical, and I didn't catch the word, without critical, Venture, did you say, or you can say yeah, critical engagement or critical viewpoint, maybe yeah, without a critical uh, or or maybe what you are saying, if I want to take it from there, that tone down your theoretical uh, uh, kind of you know engagement or theoretical debate in your research or even in your if you are going to do a study, uh, what. Uh, uh, what we see typically the media studies have been doing uh, and the journalism, journalism studies, particularly in this context of South Asia are becoming, uh, is, uh, is becoming very, very popular and they are barely doing the content analysis. That is another kind of thing, you know, just to do the content analysis, talk about how right or left this is, how, you know, uh, pro particular government or anti-government this is. So, that is somewhere saying that yes, we are we are talking about politics, we are talking about society, we are talking about religion, but then your engagement is becoming very thin, and that is where the problem I think I'm trying to uh, point out. And there I think we need much more critical and in-depth engagement, both theoretically and methodologically. Uh, but yeah, that's the challenge we all are facing, maybe. Uh, uh, so. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. I just saw. Sorry, I, I just saw a message from Jay, and he's actually not going to make it. Um, if there are other questions, um, I'll continue. But uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to to put them up. Then we'll stop. But I do want to say something about Jay Murphy, who was supposed to be part of this panel, 
Um, and here's uh, a scholar I've known for a long time. His initial work was on Palestine, uh, long, long, long ago, like 30 years ago, and so on. But I've, I've and I've known him 20, I suppose. I, I knew of his book on Palestine, but uh, he's done subsequently been working in New Orleans. And he's got a, a new book out and one book before already with the publishing house that I, I run on Arto and new media. Antonin and Arto. And I must say that he convincingly shows us the relevance of Arto. Uh, 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 I'll write down the name in case anyone don't, doesn't recognize what my accent or something. Antonin Arto. And like he was way out there in the French. 1930s and 1940s and, uh, uh, as a writer and uh, to say he's a media theorist and to bring him into media theorizing and and, and so on beyond Guattari and, and that whole psychiatry is pretty inspired. So I really regret that he couldn't get his uh, Zoom stuff sorted out. As I don't see any other questions, I'm going to thank our uh, three speakers two and, and one uh, in two papers. Um, they didn't quite go together, but they did. So that's really uh, starts us off well for this um, panel in uh, a, a theme of media uh, anthropology. We have quite a few more. I see quite a few of the people who are presenting later on were in this session. So this discussion will build, right? And it's going to build in these two dimensions from one, the, the material, the, the, actual material that we're, we're, we're studying and the theorizing about how to study it and what disciplines are. I thank you all. I thank everyone else for, for joining us. And um, we're muddling through with tech issues, but we're getting there. It's really <laughs> quite good. Thank you so much for Thanks, John. joining oh, us. John. And we now take a lunch break, I believe. Let me quickly look at my schedule. Um, and we have a, have a break, and then after the break, there's uh, keynote sessions, right? Starting at, at 1.20 Vietnam time, so do your math and work out where you are. We don't know exactly where everyone is, so you, it's, it's your, uh, I mean, the internet media does that for us now. You don't have to actually do the math. Uh, Professor Win Hu Min is speaking as the first keynote, and the second one is uh, one of the, the, the regulars of the conference uh, and of conferences that you've organized, Fiza, Anab Roy Chowdhury from um, Moscow, although he's in India at present, so the time zone is a bit better. So, okay, uh, that's going to end this session for now. Uh, we'll see you at, what time did I say? 13.20. Okay, one twenty Vietnam time. Thank you very much for this opportunity, John. It was great as usual. Thank you. Thank you.